5.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to this session, Friday session. The title is FOSS LIDAR Reader and New Smart Decimation Techniques. And Paul Schromer is going to be our presenter. I do have a couple of housekeeping things that I want to go over before we actually get started with the presentation. Um, my name is Elizabeth. I'm going to be monitoring the chat, so please feel free to send your questions during the presentation. We're going to save about five minutes for the, at the end to, um, for Paul to go over your questions. So without anything else, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Paul and let him give a quick introduction of himself and start the presentation. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I think we got our wires crossed on the uh, pronunciation of my last name. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's okay. okay. Um, I, I've heard a lot of creative uh, things. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I'm a PhD student at North Carolina State University in the Forestry and Environmental Resources Program with a specialization there in GIS. And um, so the name of the um, presentation it kind of changed back when I submitted my um, my prospectus or my uh, abstract in December. I was calling this smart decimation, but I realized smart is for phones and smart is for cars, and and it doesn't quite fit with decimation. So the new name is curvature weighted decimation. <clears throat> and when you see curvature weighted decimation, you may think, hmm, I wonder what that means. Well, I'm glad you asked because that's what we're going to explain during this. So uh, curvature weighted decimation of LIDAR points. <clears throat> this is the fruit of some of my PhD research at NC State. The, uh, the module is free open source code under the, uh, I think it's the Apache license. Uh, and you can see the, um, the GitHub repository at the bottom right on some of my slides. And CogoDN is the name of the module. And it's CogoDN because it works under .NET. So the, the programming language that I use is C-sharp. Um, CogoDN has two focuses. Roadway alignments is one focus, and that's all I'm gonna say about that during this presentation because the main focus is the branch of CogoDN that focuses on terrain modeling using triangulated irregular networks. So what problem are, is out there that we're trying to solve? Well, the problem is that LiDAR files are big. And uh, we want to find a way to make the data footprint of the file smaller without losing the accuracy that we get, the accuracy advantage that we get with this wonderful LIDAR data provided by the state of North Carolina. So let's back up a little bit and talk about which LIDAR files are big. So if you go to sdd.nc.gov, some of you are very, very familiar with this, and some of you are seeing this for the first time. So you go here, and after you've got your NCID pass, um, you go here and you, you log in and you are presented with this window. And we, if we chose elevation, then we would get rasters. Uh, if we chose flood zones, we would get uh, shape files. What we want to choose is QL1, QL2 LIDAR, which is where we get last files. Last files are the embodiment of the actual LIDAR point cloud data. So that's what we click. We come and, and we get a window that shows the whole state. I have zoomed in on my study area, um, not the whole study area, just one tile. So uh, you can select one tile and then uh, you pick a tile and that's in the general vicinity of um, where I'm gonna be showing you some data. And then you get this window <clears throat> and we wanna be sure to only get bare earth. Bare earth in the North Carolina data set is Two is classified as two for ground and 13 for roadway. And um, you can also, if you get all of the data, including buildings and vegetation and bridges and everything, you can still filter it, filter out for two and 13 in uh, Kogo DN. But it's bare earth that this works on. And once you see why, well, once you understand the algorithm a little better, you'll understand why you need to focus on bare earth in your LiDAR data sets. So then you submit the request and it, um, it downloads these LiDAR files for you. Uh, it, it, it composes them and offers to let you download them and put them where you want. So as you can see, um, these LiDAR files, they're just bare earth 
and the um, it's eight pulses per square meter. And so that makes each of these LIDAR files is 2,500 feet square. So if I wanted 5,000 feet square uh, and I got those four files, that's, all, that's half of a gigabyte. And so that's what I mean by the files are big. Uh, if you want to find out more about this, you can go to the 2019 NCGIS conference uh, presentation by, um, I, I forget his name. I, will, I should have written it down. Anyway, the you can see here that the name of the uh, video is LIDAR State of the State. And that gives a great overview of std.nc.gov, the special data download page. And I highly recommend it. Um, so now, LIDAR files are big, and we have all of these um, cookie droplets that Ethel and Lucy are trying to process, but it goes so fast that they have to stick some of them in their shirts and eat some of them anyway. What is decimation? Uh, decimation is where you pick points to toss out. So with random decimation, you simply uh, come up with a way to use a computer's random number generator, and some of them it says keep and some of them it says throw out. And so you, you have no control, no, no way to know which points are gonna be kept and which points are gonna be thrown out. And what if you threw out an important point? Well, that kind of raises the question of how do you know which points are more important and how, which are points are less important or even redundant? So that's where curvature weighted decimation comes in. So if you take these points and imagine we're looking down straight down from bird's eye view, and then we tilt it back to a perspective view. Now we've got these points from the LIDAR file. And what do we do with them? Well, what COGO DM does with them is it creates a triangulated irregular network. That's where all of these points have tri triangles um, tessellated among them. And you get something like this. So there's a couple of things to notice. First of all, this is Celia Creek uh, near Total State Forest in Caldwell County between Mordenton and Lenore. And um, over on the left, you see the floodplain and you can see how small those triangles are and how many of those triangles there are. So pay attention to that because um, that is an indication of the point density. Then there on the stream banks of Celia Creek, you've got um, less density, but that could be because the vegetation was blocking some of the laser pulses. Also at the bottom where the where Unity 3D, when I made this with Unity 3D, it clipped off the front. Well, think of that as a cross-section profile. So we're gonna see that again in, in another slide soon. And that cross-section profile is important to hydrologists among other people. Also roadway design engineers like cross-sections as well. But if you look at that cross-section and you can think, how does um, random decimation preserve that cross-section? And how does curvature weighted decimation preserve that cross section? So the big idea is that um, if you if you look here at the stream bank, that's a big error between the actual terrain and the uh, the profile that's cut from the triangles. Another big error down here, smaller error here, and then almost negligible error here. As a matter of fact, the error here is so negligible that you could remove that tri that point and you would still have pretty accurate terrain information um, along, along the floodplain. So this, uh, this cross section is gonna um, become small and go to the right. And then the rest of the cross section might look something like this. This is actually something I made up for uh, the paper I'm presenting. And uh, you can see over here that there's less curvature, but there's still enough curvature that there's some error. So we can get rid of two points here, but only one point here. So we're using the curvature of the terrain to identify which points are carrying more information with them. Therefore, they need to be retained. <clears throat> so another way to look at the big idea is to just look at what if you had a uh, perfect circle or an arc segment of a circle. And the first one was a radius of one. That means that the curvature of one over one is one and the maximum error is 0 0.134. If we can call these units meters, we can call them feet, uh, as long as they're the same units. So C is the spacing between the sample points. 
and 0 0.134 is the maximum error of that representation. If you cut the curvature in half to 0.5 meters or 0.5 to the negative one meters, um, then you've got a lower maximum error there at the middle with the same point sampling distance. So that's some interesting theory, Paul, but is it working? How can you be sure that this is even working? Well, what I did was I created a grid across the whole, um, the whole panel, the whole 2,500 foot by 2,500 foot panel. And at 10 foot grid space intervals, I just got the elevation from the original 10 model, the undecimated 10 model, which you see here. And then I compared it to the, uh, to the same grid elevations on the, um, on the decimated ones. So, you know, get this in your mind and then compare that to, the, to decimating to 15% using random decimation, which is this one. And you can see that well, the points are definitely less sparse. But how's that profile doing? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> what's the maximum error? What's the average error between uh, the decimated 10 model that, that has been created after decimating down to 15% of the original uh, and the original undecimated 10? Well, we can uh, use using Unity 3D on the wavefront objects. Um, we can see that there's there's a pretty substantial error there where it just kind of cut a cord across that stream bank. So I measured that, and uh, that's about a six foot vertical error right there. So if you're a hydrologist and you're modeling cross sections to go into a, a hydrology modeling program that might be a significant error in terms of the hydrology that you're trying to work with. So here is what it looks like when we decimate it to 15% using curvature weighted decimation. And as you can see, the sparsity of the points is about the same as random decimation to 15%. So we're about the same there, but that profile, how does that profile look? Well, let's look at it no error there. And the reason there's no error there is because part of the algorithm found those, um, those points with high curvature at the, at the break line and said, we're gonna keep all of those points. So that's what it means for it to be weighted. It's the, whether or not you keep a point, the priority of that is weighted by the curvature of the point. So, yeah, so I'll put that slide in there again, just so you can compare. All right, so that pictures are pretty, but they're kind of anecdotal. How can you get a large amount of information so that you can run some statistics? Well, basically, in December, I spent a week watching my computer run this for over a thousand times, and I did. Um, random decimation, and then I did curvature weighted decimation. I gathered the statistics on that, and I did that on six dis different panels to get a, a variety of terrain. So I did one at Coweta, in, in the mountains, Tuttle State Forest, uh, like I said, near Lenore. Killett's Creek is where some other uh, research had been done, and then Schenck Forest is a research forest that NC State owns. Brunswick is a, is a Brunswick County Park. I selected that because um, it should be easy to access if we ever wanna go do a survey there. And then Bullneck Swamp is, uh, is truly a swamp owned by NC State. We might be able to get access uh, if we wanna go survey that later. Those are the study sites. We're focusing on Tuttle State Forest because uh, we've only got 20 minutes. How does it look? Well, the red line, is about random decimation. The blue line is about, uh, I almost said smart decimation, didn't I? Uh, curvature weighted decimation. And along the bottom are the various levels of decimation. So the 50 means 50% 50 decimation. And so the file size, if I were able to create a file right now, the, the point count, let's call it that. The point count is 50% um, of the original. So as you get down closer to 10% and 1%, the, uh, the worst is the error, the uh, absolute error. But that's my best looking statistic right there. 
because it's the maximum error of the whole panel. What about another way to look at it? What about root mean square error? How good is that? Does that look as impressive? No, it doesn't. It, it's uh, not nearly as great of an improvement. We're still improving, but notice a few things. On the right, at 50% decimation, uh, we're, we're about, um, the error, the root mean square error is about half of what it was uh, for random. But as you move closer and closer to 0% uh, decimation, which if you had 0% decimation, you would have a file with no data in it, of course. But the advantage goes away. And curvature weighted decimation starts to behave uh, just as much, uh, just as poorly as random decimation. So, um, but there's another way I'd like for us to think about this. So I'm gonna turn this uh, chart on its side so that the independent variable is now absolute error, uh, absolute root mean square error, and the dependent variable is, um, is decima decimation percent, and ask if I wanted to compare curvature weighted decimation to random decimation at 50%, what kind of improvement am I getting there? And the answer for Tuttle State Forest, the Tuttle, this particular Tuttle State Forest uh, data set is that decimation rate of about 0.26 feet that you get at 50% random decimation, you can get with 15% of curvature weighted decimation. So if I was, uh, publishing this in the New York Times, that's what I would want the headline to read, a 70% improvement. Although that is, um, that is you know, cherry picking the headline to make it look as, as good as it can. So a little bit on how Togo DN works as we come up to the 20 minute mark per, here pretty soon. Um, it runs as a console application. It runs under um, .NET and you, you can enter commands as a, uh, interactively, or you can give it a command text file. And here's the command text file that I use. So you can see the first line is where I set the filter to only accept points of um, classification two and classification 13. That's bare earth of, of ground points and roadway points. And then I just set the input directory and the output directory, and then I load the last file. When I load that last file, it creates the triangulated irregular network in memory. How do I save the triangulated irregular network? Well, you can save that as a wavefront object. So then I decimate random, I, I decimate it to 15% using the random technique, and I create a uh, wavefront object of that. That's how I was able to visualize these, is with these wavefront objects. And then I decimate it uh, using curvature weighted decimation. And I save that one to the wavefront object. So the usage is pretty simple, I believe. But then again, I wrote it, so I would obviously have a good understanding of it. Some things to know. These are important things to know. Cogo DN runs on .NET Core 3.1. It was developed on Windows. It has been tested on Linux under an Ubuntu distribution. And uh, it hasn't been tested on OS 10, but we expect that it should run on OS 10 once we get a chance to test it there. Here's the big one. This is kind of like the wah, wah, wah. Um, it does not yet create new last files. So what is this for? Well, it's, it's for writing a uh, research paper, but um, I've worked on, on making it write out new last files, but uh, my, the first time I worked on it, I spent six hours and it didn't work. So I've got to spend more time on that and I plan to do that in the next few weeks. So it does, as of the recording of this video, it does not write new last files, but I promise that's a priority for me in the near future. And then there's room for uh, improvement, improvement in the algorithm, such as those uh, low, low decimation values, getting those to be more competitive against random decimation. In other words, more research is needed. So, as we prepare to move into questions, let me do some acknowledgements. I just want to thank my advisor, Dr. Stacy Nelson, for all the help he's given me, but also a friend of mine who was a PhD candidate in the Department of Math at NC State, Carter Jamison. Carter spent uh, hours and hours with me over the past year 
uh, meeting in, in person and then meeting on Zoom. And he basically kept me from going crazy and using uh, equations and concepts that, that just don't wash. So um, it's a big thank you to both of these gentlemen. And so Elizabeth, I think, uh, I think I'm ready for questions. All right, thank you, Paul. That's some really fascinating stuff. Um, we do have a question that's come in. Um, it is, are the decimated products only for use in tins? Are there other products where it can be used as topo generation and DEMs? Um, the short answer to that is yes, it can be used in those other products. But if you're creating a raster DEM, you are already doing a, uh, a data reduction, a, a form of compression. So if, if your end goal is a DEM, then there's no reason to uh, a raster DEM such as a GOTS. And there's not really a need to go through this step because if you've got a, if you've got a 150 megabyte last file, and the DEM is 10 megabytes, there's no, there's, you're already reducing that. Where there could be a, a, another data product is in the reduced last file. Um, and then further, uh, I didn't emphasize this, but a data product that I envision, uh, I just don't have it refined yet perfectly, is getting cross sections. So cross sections are used by hydrologists and roadway design engineers to, to get uh, a profile across the terrain. And then they take those uh, hydro, the hydrologists and, and hydraulic engineers take those hydraulic cross sections of the streams and they put them into software like HECRAS. And, and so that's another data product though. It, if you were to generate a cross section, if you were to generate a cross section from a 10 model, like you saw here, that's going to be more accurate than if you generate it from a three meter raster, because you just have more points in your data set. Um, I, hope that, I hope that answers the question. Right, we have, a, we have another one from Patrick Williams. Um, it says, Paul, have you considered output as .xyz instead of LAS? Uh, .xyz, uh, can you ask Patrick if uh, he means uh, comma separated values of, uh, of text? All right, I think Patrick should have heard that question from you, so I'm going to give him a minute to respond, and we're going to move on to uh, another question while we wait. Um, this one is from Sam. Um, the question is, what applications do you expect this to have for NCDOT employees, if any? Uh, NCDOT, I think, would benefit a lot from this um, because, especially for the uh, hydraulic engineers, but also for roadway engineers doing preliminary plans. Um, right now, the industry as I understand it, is using um, raster files to simulate to to represent terrain models, and as you can as you could see with um, with Celia Creek, those Celia Creek images. Um, although I didn't show a raster representation, rasters smooth it out so much that small creeks like Celia Creek and its tributaries become. Um, inaccurate, too inaccurate to really safely model that. So this tool could be used by NCDOT or NCDOT consultants to um, reduce the file size on a lot of last files and then um, create cross sections from those. Um, back to Patrick's question, uh, if, if... And he, he's actually said yes, CSVs. Okay, so that's actually very easy for me to do. I haven't done it yet. Um, but if I choose to do that, which obviously I will, since it's been mentioned now, um, that will come up, uh, that, that's two hours of coding, two hours of programming work for me. So I'll probably do that. Right. You have one, another question coming through. 
Um, does the surface water elevation affect the accuracy of the cross section? Yes. Um, LIDAR and, and um, the 2019 presentation covers this as well. LIDAR at the frequency that they used for uh, spatial data download uh, does not reflect off of water. So what you have is where there's water in a pond or a river or a stream, it's, it's just a gap in the coverage. It looks like higher sparsity of points. And so if you are creating an alignment down the center line of the creek, or, or this also happens with the um, with cross sections, where you cross the water, the, the terrain representation over the water is gonna be a little bit high. And it varies, it's, it's not the same at every point. So it, um, yeah, so if we look here, of course this is the uh, blended one, but you see here, how this cuts across the stream, you're just not getting the bathymetry there. Um, so I, I probably could have just said yes. All right, well, it looks like at this point, that was our last question. So and we are right at the transition time, so Thank you so much, Paul. Unless you have anything else that you'd like to add, um, I'll go ahead and end this session. Um, well, like the song says, email me. No, the song says call me, maybe. Email me if you uh, want to talk about it more. All right, sounds great. Well, again, thank you so much, Paul, and thank you, everybody.